It's my pleasure to introduce Jody Lin Ki Chow, a Jamaican-born interdisciplinary artist whose work incorporates installation and live performance to investigate cultural identity. Jody has shown work and done performances at venues such as the Queens Museum of Art, Open Art Museum of the Americas in Washington, D.C., Mokata, which is a museum of contemporary African diaspora and arts in New York, Rush Arts Gallery in New York, El Museo del Barrio, Contemporary Art Center in Beijing, the 2015 iteration of Spring Break, Lehman Maupin uh, here in New York, and Exit Art here in New York, among others. This year, she was commissioned to present both visual art and live performance in the landmark exhibition Jamaican Pulse, Art and Politics from Jamaica and the Diaspora at the Royal West Academy of England in Bristol. She, also she was also included in the 2017 Jamaica Biennial, which will be at the National Gallery in Kingston, Jamaica. Jody is a Rima Hort Mann nominee and is a 2012 New York Foundation for the Arts Fellow in Interdisciplinary Art. She received a BFA from New World School of Arts uh, at the University of Florida in 1996 and an MFA from Hunter College in 2006. We're happy to welcome Jody to our faculty here in the MFA Fine Arts Department at SVA uh, and to welcome her to our talk series this evening. Please join me in welcoming jo Jody Lin Ki Chow. Thank you, Mark. So I will be doing just an uh, excerpt from a fairly recent performance, and then I will be giving the talk. So, give me a moment. Load the balloons. Pass it back, pass it around. <laughs> Just throw them on the floor. <laughs> pass it around, pass it around. The goal is that I can get them into the aisles, like in the, yeah, in the walkway area where I'm walking. So feel free to throw them this way. <laughs> Navigated in such a space. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, can we play that again, please? Can we play the song again?
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for participating. Uh, so that was an excerpt from my fairly recent piece called America the Beautiful. And uh, all right, now I can start this. Sorry, I need a moment. It's quite physical. So, um, yeah. I'm Jody Linky Chow. I was born in Manchester, Jamaica. That's the uh, considered the countryside of Jamaica in 1975. And so it was a time before things got much more modernized there. And um, basically, uh, my parents are considered like upper middle class there. And um, my, my uh, I guess I could start by saying my, my maternal side, uh, my mom, she is a, a banker. and. Uh, She's pretty talented into fashion and interior design. My uh, father, he is a power, plant, a power plant senior operator slash engineer into mechanics and that kind of thing. And uh, into architecture a little bit too. But um, my maternal grandmother's side, uh, my grandmother is a prize winning horticulturist, now a farmer and my grandfather who, uh, he was an innovative farmer at the time, drafting produce together to form hybrid, um, hybrid combinations of plants like flowers and fruit. So he would basically put a tomato on a cherry tree and have it bloom that way. So, um, and then my father's side, my uh, grandfather is a Chinese migrant. Well, actually, the story is a bit confusing because my last name, Linky Chow, um, is Chinese. Um, my father's father's side of the family is from Guangdong province, Guangdong, China. And um, my, I don't know too much about that side of the family, but from what I do know is that they founded a pretty famous pick of peppa sauce. I don't know if you know of it, it's with the parrot on it in the middle. And um, my grandmother was a single mother and a, far a farmer. So all of my uh, ancestors that I know of um, were pretty much like my grandparents and before them were laborers. Um, also, um, the Jamaican side of my family um, um, obviously are from, um, well, we all, they came from Africa, so. I don't have to go into that too much. There is a rich history of that here. But um, for the most part, I feel like um, all that I said about my grandparents' labor is very much a part of my own work. Um, it's pretty labor intensive. Um, and maybe it wasn't all that way. Maybe at first it was just play. But um, as soon as I I decided to go to school and study art more. It just um, became much, much more involved, which would be a natural progression. But um, so here I am in my grandmother's garden picking flowers, and here I am in my, in my parents' yard playing with water hoses. And I don't know if that's the first performance, but I was a very, very shy child. And so um, performance has been a way for me to kind of open up. OK, so the next slide here. Um, this is one of my first few, uh, my first paintings that I made in undergrad. Um, I was playing a lot with abstraction after playing, after um, going to, to, to high school in um, Miramar, Florida, South Florida, and studying, you know, traditional painting, drawing, um, 2D, very little 3D. Um, and I wanted to break out of that. I found myself, I was drawing a lot from fashion magazines. And unfortunately, I don't have images of that here to show you. But um, 
I quickly broke free of that after I attended art school in Miami at New World School of the Arts. And I was introduced to um, printmaking and other, um, other forms of, of art making. So um, here, this piece was created after I did a residency at Vermont Studio Center as part of, um, of just being a, a senior there in uh, New World. And I was drawn to fish, maybe <coughs> primarily because I remember my father, when growing up in Jamaica, would go to the pond, it's called Alligator Pond, and he would do fishing, but mainly um, fishing for, you know, uh, shellfish, you know, um, lobsters, crabs, that kind of thing. But this is kind of something that was, it, it came from a personal place and um, resonated to, with me when I saw Korean, uh, Korean art students um, eating raw fish. So um, I just took some of the anchovies and uh, started to uh, create these um, assemblage type paintings. And there, I did a series of about 50 of these on the wall for my undergraduate thesis show. And some were just, just abstract with collages and fabric, and some had like um, actual objects on them. So this is a, uh, you know, mixed media on canvas, but there's some oil and graphite on there. Um, and then this image here is um, created around the same time. Um, I, my, my parents, uh, shortly after moving to uh, this area in Florida called uh, Pembroke Pines, it's closer to the Everglades. Um, it was, uh, it was at first just all raw nature there. And as soon as um, development plans kicked in and there were lots of houses being built there, um, I found myself um, ramaging through the construction sites and um, collecting the, all forms of detritus and just wrapping them with, um, with fabric, kind of as a way to um, salvage things. And I think that whole idea of salvaging things came from when I was uh, in Jamaica, um, not having much provided for me. So we didn't have Toys R Us when I was growing up there. There was no Toys R Us store. There wasn't really like a major big uh, toy store. So I found myself um, playing a lot with um, cardboard boxes. Um, I, I might have had like one or two dolls. Maybe they weren't even real Barbie, but I found myself making uh, furniture for the Barbies and clothes and I just got really, really creative. Now that I think about it, I was playing outside in the construction uh, with the marl and the sand that they would have out front of my dad's house that he was building for us there in Jamaica. And I found myself kind of going, going, repeating that when we moved to this area of Florida. And it was like history was repeating itself, seeing these construction sites go up on all this material. So. Um, I found a way to make art with this material, and this is just one of the few pieces that I made um, towards the end of, I was probably a junior um, at the time, making this, these works. Um, and then, um, I think this was created, yeah, right after I got out of undergrad, I, uh, I was just still collecting objects. Even though I did a lot of uh, painting and printmaking, I found myself completely like just forgetting all of that and, and finding these materials I, I find in daily life and just putting them together. It was kind of, it was kind of um, really fun for me, a fun activity, and to make compositions out of these objects. So as you see here, these are just random balloons I'd find going to a party, you know, and I'd find them on the floor, pick them up, and create like a whole bunch of um, collages with these. And here, uh, this was, yeah, maybe a year later, I found myself working a lot more with ceramics again, like I did in undergrad, but um, trying to make this is kind of like uh, these, these forms that I made. I made a number of forms like this. They were very phallic in shape, as you see. And so they kind of resembled each other. But at the same time, they were 
kind of like the dolls that I remember playing with, so accessorizing the doll kind of thing. And um, this here is made out of black clay, and I, I think of it as a very figurative thing because here I am dressing up this form. She has like this trail behind her. So it's kind of made me think of a wedding party. So I made a, I made a series of these and they're called, altogether it was called the wedding party. So it was about three of these pieces, but um, it's just one of them. And then I, I was very, very curious about performance even when I was studying in undergrad, but felt like I, it wasn't really the best place to explore that because it was, I was a painting major, and even though I took dance classes at an interdisciplinary art school, um, it didn't really come into formation um, yet for me about what performance art really was. I was reading up a lot on some Chris Burden and um, Marina Abramovich, and then I came across the work of Yoyoi Kusama, and, um, and then I was like, oh wow, then I feel like this is really playful, I could connect with it, the forms, everything. And, um, and so I held on to my red uniform from um, my high school drill team. I really missed that activity of dancing and movement. And so, yeah, for me it made sense. Let me just play around with some performance. So, um, I, I, moved, I moved to New York in the year 2000, and um, all I had with me was um, a few art supplies, maybe a few art pieces, and um, I had an apartment in the Bronx all the way up there, and um, like really North Bronx, <laughs> and um, I had a little, I had some space, so I was able to um, kind of keep working, and I kind of, Aside from painting, I'm not even, I, I kind of lost interest in it and wanted to do some experimentation. And I, and I was really into doing these makeup paintings. So this is one of the makeup paintings that I did. And um, this piece is called Mil Besos um, because there's someone in my life that told me this all of the time whenever they said bye. And I was like, oh, I wonder what that would look like. So. I did this ritualistic performance and just kissed, um, put lipstick on my lips every time I made this impression. And so it was also a form of printmaking um, that, that really resonated with me. Um, so this is one of the few, the first few sculptural pieces I made back at Hunter in grad school. Um, uh, the object for me in this case was kind of, um, I don't know, this particular object, the water hose. For me, it just represented this conduit and how it replaced the, the, the need for the farmer or the need, not necessarily the farmer, but the laborer that was carrying water back and forth. And this is what I, I remembered seeing when I was growing up in Jamaica in the countryside, visiting my grandmother, that side of the country where it was much more, more rural, technology was slower to come. And so they often spoke of these stories of how they would carry things from point A to point B, how like they didn't have shoes, or, or, or how um, water is transmitted from the back of the house, which they would have a water tank, and that water tank would, um, it always had to be full. There was such a huge priority on, this, on having this water tank full to provide water for the entire household for a certain period of time. So that, that for me, it just resonated with me and at the same time, so the water hose is kind of like a friend but it also is, and I'm saying a friend, but um, it was a useful thing to have, but at the same time it, it replaced the labor um, where um, someone who may have made an income carrying such items uh, no longer had a job. <laughs> so um, here is uh, the mid program, my mid program review at Hunter. Um, I actually had an extra year to prepare my mid program review because um, even though I was making paintings when I started Hunter, I applied as a painter. Um, I felt like it wasn't my best medium. I, I felt like I was 
coming up short a lot of the times and I just wasn't very confident in my work as a painter and so I, I went back to the object for that reason or making uh, pieces that kind of were uh, much more about material and um, as you notice I have a lot of vinyls in, in the work in the works here I use a lot of the plastic vinyl material and it came from also observing the decor of my my grandparents' homes, especially their kitchens, and they would put up these these uh, plastic tablecloths they'd find from the 99 cent store, or not, well, for them there, it would be like the china shops, um, of which, you know, uh, there are a lot of the china shops there in Jamaica, that's how a lot of the Chinese migrants uh, make a living. So they would be selling these um, very affordable items that you'd find in a typical 99 cent store here. So, um, the kitchen tables would be decked out with these and you'd find often when you go into a, um, a, Jamaican <laughs> a Jamaican's house in the countryside or sometimes here that the furniture would be covered with plastic and so I liked this kitschiness of um, the material. It made me think a lot too of the interiors of the dollhouses that I was making. Um, all right, so this is just one of the pieces that I had there in that installation. Um, it's a water hose that I covered, basically outfitted with the tablecloth, the plastic tablecloth, and I was also playing a lot with um, the motors that, um, there's this fascination, fascination with motors too because my father was a part-time mechanic, so I, I think that's kind of where it came from, this interest in, in playing with movement and um, the motor part of it. Um, so, and here in the bowl too, there is this um, watercolor pencil, which I tend to use a lot now in my drawings, but I was really interested in how the effect of the watercolor pencil if it's freshly drawn and having water inside of the ceramic bowl that's not glazed would kind of um, seep through. So there was this kind of etherealness about it too. I really um, enjoy. Um, so this is a video piece, one of the fir first video pieces that I made back at Hunter also, and this was in the mid-program review. And this particular uh, video was played in my first group show at Rush Arts, and it was reviewed in New York Art World. Yeah. 
Okay, so that was um, created in California. I went out there in the summer of 2003, I think, and then <laughs> that was basically him directing me, but when I edited the video, of course, what you saw translated on the bottom was what he was saying. Um, here's another quick video. Um, this was created at Hunter, and um, basically that's just a, a whole, another narrative of the, the water hose.
Okay, thank you. Um, so at, at the end, of course, you know, I, I was playing a lot with, um, you know, effects, and and that was Kool Aid that I had my friend Zachary Fabry pour in the water hose when <laughs> I was on the floor. Um, so then that that kind of led to the the idea behind my my senior well my thesis piece in uh, a Hunter, and um, I made another water hose, but this time with with vinyl and foam inside. So this particular hose, it kind of looks like the fire hoses, but um, it's, it's something other than that. Um, I was interested in, you know, just metamorphosis and how one thing could kind of engulf another um, and have a form of its own. So this is about 345 feet by six inches. It's quite an ambitious piece to make. And at the end of it would be a capsule where my body would fit into. And so I exhibited that piece um, uh, shortly after um, in a show at SUNY Old Westbury because the curator went to my thesis show and I decided last minute to, to, to act out the performance of the installation. So if I, I felt like if I didn't decide to do performance, that curator probably would have just walked on by and did not even think of putting me in this show. She did a show, a three-person show on, it was called Entrapment, and it was about women, women, and, um, women of Asian descent using performance. Um, so in that, in that show, I was able to actually spread out the water hose, this hose piece more, and it went from the inside of the gallery to the outside where um, I did the performance. It was a durational type performance. And uh, at the action was I had a, a water, a water sprayer inside of it with me, and so when people walked by, I would spray them. And you know, eventually I got out of that. So um, and I was watering the plants at the same time, so it was kind of funny. Um, I was interested in more comical, but also you know the satire kind of play. Um, and this is the other part of that installation um, where I had um, this is the projection from the ceiling uh, splashed onto the floor. It was in the form of just a puddle or water. And I'm swimming in and out of it. So that was shot in a suburban backyard, and I just played around with the way that I was um, projecting it on the floor. Um, and so that piece actually showed in Miami, too, for an Art Basel one year. I don't remember, maybe 2007 or something. And so um, this is the other part of that same thesis installation that was shown.
that was all about the um, the nature, and and I, I shot that in the Everglades, and I specifically. Um, Uh, thought a, I thought a lot about the landscape, and it, the landscape for me just kind of brought me back to the rural landscape in Jamaica. And, and then at the same time, I was studying 18th century landscape paintings for art history at Hunter. And um, I came across images like Koros here and, and the nymphs that would be in the landscape. And so um, I don't know if you noticed the figure from afar in the video. I was all the way yards down <laughs> by the water and um, the, the, the meaning of that behind that is kind of this, this water hose is a creature of itself and it just encroached upon the native in the landscape. Um, so that was something that I was thinking about. Um, and shortly after I graduated, um, Papa Colo, I met Papa Colo at Exit Art as a matter of fact, um, I forgot to read this, uh, this statement that he asked me to read because we were going to speak up, to speak up here together, but because he's in the rainforest right now, um, I'm here doing this on my own and that's okay. But he's my mentor and I will get, I will hope, uh, hopefully I'll get to read that um, at the close of this. But this is the first performance that um, I, I did at Exit Art after being introduced to them, um, a friend from Hunter said, hey, you need performance artists, you need to meet Jody." And so we were introduced, and ever since then, like the family that I had at Exit Art, you know, that's what they were, a family. So um, I had the opportunity to do this performance called Tipple, and um, it was based on, well, the, the theme of the show was Water Project, well, on water, so the title was Water Project. Okay, so that was specifically created for Water Project. The, the theme was on water conservation. And so I rigged up a water hose to the piping and had it very discreetly placed. So people were wondering, where's this water coming from? Is it really pipe leaking? So I was playing a lot with trickery. <laughs> um, and that was a really fun piece to do. And it was really tough because I stood there for about two hours in heels. And people were like, what's with this crazy lady? 
Um, so this piece is called Kissing Column, and this one was created also at Exit Art for um, uh, the show called Wild Girls. And um, basically, I walked around the column, the column and had a lipstick on me, and every time that I made a kiss, it, it would help to form a word, and then the word would form a phrase. So at first, I wrote the word, he kissed me, so I kissed H back, and then eventually it formed, she kissed me, so I kissed her back. And so that got a, like a little review. Um, and then another piece I did for Exit Art, this one is called Serious Games. So um, it was about sport and um, the physicality of sport. And so I created this installation with um, vinyl and wood. And I used the, um, the you see that fencing in the background. Um, I kind of incorporated it into my installation with the fake swimming pool. And I did these actions uh, on that vinyl going back and forth. And it was padded, but sure enough, I had back aches for a while. Um, but that just goes with it. Um, I had uh, my friend Monica played the coach, and uh, she was kind of giving me instruction. She was kind of the mediator between the audience. The audience would approach her. There were instructions on the wall, tell the audience what to do to interact. So they would tell her, the, the, the swimming move that I should do, and then I would interpret that swimming pool, that, that swimming move on the pool platform that I made. And then um, I, I got this work uh, into the Queen's Biennial. Um, I had a studio out in Long Island City at the time, and um, the, the daffodils were just coming up. But that was kind of accidental. Uh, I was already making this piece with the same um, materials with the yellow and the camouflage. And the time I made it, I thought about the, the Iraq war, um, the, which had just begun shortly before. And um, I thought a lot about um, camouflaging and how can we tell if there's a terrorist in our backyard. And so um, I was thinking, what would this look like? Um, so. My imagination took me there. It wasn't just a body bag. It was actually in the guise of a vine. And I was inspired by also the vines on the wall, but um, a specific vine that um, I grew up um, using, you know, seeing in Jamaica and using the, um, from the vine. This is the, uh, the installation at the Queen's Museum. And so I made all these tendrils. And so I did a lot of sewing. Um, in the work. It took some time to make, and the fence was a part of it as well. And this is what the, the vine looks like. It's also like a blood thinner, and um, they say too, like in Jamaica, if you, or it doesn't matter where, but if you smoke marijuana, this is the tea you should drink to kind of clear your, your blood. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so it, was, it had like this um, interesting connotation. And, and, double meaning. Um, so in that performance, though, at the end of it, I exited out of that bag as, um, as a ballerina. So then I had a solo show at Rush Arts. Um, and this piece is kind of dealing with salvaging something at the same time, this, this form, this, this magic flower. And this, this, this piece deals more with fantasy, the whole installation. I was thinking a lot about children's storybooks and so, and character, character development. And so I made this character, you know, her name is Bo Peep, but she roams the forest. And um, in the forest, uh, she finds this magnificent flower that was, you know, basically made, or basically it's like the, the, the the magic of the story is she finds this magical flower. It, it only sprouts like once every thousand years, and it's the home of this mag magic dragonfly. And um, she captures the flower. In the video, she captures the flower, takes it to the, uh, the, her garden, and then the dragonfly finds her and kills her, or flies over her and she dies because she faints. <laughs> Something like that. So this is just a video still. And I made a series of photographs that went along with the installation that kind of completed the narrative. So 
she basically is a flower thief and she goes around place to place all over the world and she finds exotic flowers and carries them and plants them in her garden. So here she is on the landscape in Jamaica, where close to where I grew up, and it's a river, a river area. And so when I drove by this location one time, I think it was maybe 2007, 2008, um, I, I, I superimposed from Photoshop um, a series of poses. I did a separate photo shoot for the figure and then I um, dropped them in into these landscapes. Um, this piece was recently shown again um, in Jamaica for the National Gallery and when I exhibited this piece this particular photograph got a lot of responses because the locals in the neighborhood there they came up to me and they said that river is not there anymore there's a drought like there is no river it's been that way for a few years so I was just kind of glad that I captured it and used it in its work. So now this is in the National Gallery. Um, so then I, I was thinking a lot still about, um, about water and, and pollution. Um, I was an avid, avid beach goer, you know, growing up in, in Jamaica and in Florida. So for me, the beach means a lot and, and to see it ruined, it really kind of bothered me. So I, I made this piece um, that I took to, to Beijing when I was invited to present there at the, um, the 10th Open International Performance Art Festival. And uh, shortly after I performed it there, I also, I also performed it in Exit Art again for their exhibition called Performance in Crisis. And um, I just have a sketch up there at the top because you know, I always start my performances with a sketch. It's always about the image and, and the concept. So I, I marry these together. And then um, I was invited to, well, I did a, there was a call for artists at this gallery in Boston, and it was called Five Objects. And the objects were a bottle, a natural object, a tool, a blanket, and a mask. So, so I, I applied with this piece, you know, just the proposal, and I was accepted. And uh, basically, I had my co-performer, who was my cousin there in the middle, he was kind of the mediator between me and the audience, and he would, he would whisper to me, I would basically whisper to him like, okay, get that person in the black jacket. And then he would have to get the black person in the black jacket, escort them over to the picnic blanket, and um, we asked them some series of questions for them to get wine or cheese. And I basically controlled the entire, the wine and cheese for the whole gallery that night. That's the only way people were gonna get wine and cheese. So um, it was this basically about taking control. Um, and then it was, then I think it was like the next day it was in daily serving. <laughs> so I thought a lot about this particular piece and the past, you know, how the countryside and it made me think of that and picnics and um, there's something about it I really liked, resonated with me. And then this image. And obviously, I was naked in that, and then I got into daily serving, so it kind of made me think, okay. Um, then I was thinking, I went back to think about picnics, and my grandmothers, as I said, they decorated their, their tables with these kitchen tablecloths, and I made a collage series of these, and so this is one of the first few, and they were presented at the at, at Artists in Residence Gallery at the time, and I was in an artist collective called Tart, and so I was able to show those there. And so then I got more uh, into politics with this work. Um, this is a um, piece called Crop Killer, um, and I was motivated to make this piece because um, a friend of mine showed me a film called Life and Debt. I don't know if you know of it, but it's based on um, globalization and and the Caribbean, basically, and it, a lot of this happened in Jamaica, where large factories like, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of one particular <coughs> factory, it might come back to me, but they, they were um, basically asking farmers to, uh, as part of signing the IMF agreement for uh, becoming more of a modernized nation, they had to sign this agreement, and so farmers were not able to, um, or allowed to, um, sell their crops. They had to pour out milk from, from free, free range 
free grazing cows and, and, and so we had to be, we, had, we lost control of being self-sustaining and had to import everything. So Jamaica became poorer as a result. And um, here's another influence I was um, thinking of. Um, well, I grew up listening to Lu Louise Bennett and um, she's like a, a storyteller, and so she tell a lot of childhood stories as well. It's for all ages, really. And I go to pantomimes and see her as a child performing. And also there is Grace Jones, which a lot of us know of. Um, so I, I kind of mix these two characters to make my crop killer character. And um, you'll see the video in a minute, but she's also kind of like a dance hall queen. Um, and here is just images from Life and Death the farmer and the banana crop. Um, I'd like to play this video. Okay, so this is the performance that was um, performed recently at Royal West Academy. Um, it was like my third performance of it. So it was commissioned for this particular show, Jamaican Pulse.
one of my most important pieces and it kind of led its way to um, the one that another one that I'll show you but um, here's one I did in Korea so after I first created <coughs> crop killer um, I, I won knife and I decided to go to Asia and this is the first piece that I, I did in um, I was invited for a performance art festival in Korea. So this is the first um, piece that I did there. And so I'm using my childhood photograph, like what I showed you in the beginning of this presentation. She's holding a flower, and I'm building a wall in front of her. So that is kind of a metaphor for um, globalization, um, massive construction in in, in these rural areas and um, gentrification, basically. So I made these bricks out of um, cupcake boxes, <laughs> spray painted them red, carried them flat on the plane, and I was collecting these, um, these elements. You'll see later. It's not very long. So I changed behind the wall into the same type of costume. Took the flower. Yeah, so basically, um, yeah, everyone in the audience got a box, and in the boxes were these, um, were shells or just random leaves or things I pick up at Central Park or, or around my, my locations here. And I basically, because it was dried, it wasn't a, a live, living, 
a living thing. I could take it on the plane. So everyone kind of got a present from here. But it was a natural present. And then here's an, the next piece I did. It was a site-specific uh, performance project in Incheon. Um, we had uh, a, few, a few artists were, were doing projects in this abandoned building. We, that was the, the reason for the residency was to um, do site performances in, these, in this uh, abandoned space. And so this is an abandoned church. And um, I did some research on the endangered species of birds there. And so um, I think this is the broadbill sandpiper bird that I made digital, uh, I found images online, manipulated it, blew it up to the natural uh, life size scale and um, made cutouts of them. And so I strung them up in the ceiling in the church and I did a very short performance there and eventually it just like laid flat and that was the image. So um, that was kind of like the precursor to this work. Um, which was shown at West Beth. It was, these are migratory shorebirds between South America and North America. So I'm, I'm also addressing migration in my work um, and immigration and being that I'm a nature lover and um, see the effects that uh, humans are causing on, on their lives, um, <laughs> lifespan. Um, it's something that's important to me. So I was doing these cutouts of this, these particular species, blowing them up to scale and um, magnifying them in some way. And here it was repeated again in a performance um, when I came back from spending some time in China, um, had some sand on the floor, we created a beach scene and did a, a few performances there where I'm kind of the one just in between the beer. So if people wanted a beer, they had to come to me and have a conversation. <laughs> So um, here is another piece that I shot in 2012 when I was there. This is really short, really stretched out 25 minutes, but I just made it shorter for the purpose of the presentation. You see it's kind of like a time-lapse video from day to night. And this particular landscape is um, in Shenzhen, which is right across from Hong Kong. And this particular scene really reminded me of um, a painting yeah, yeah, the painting by Henry Rossell called The Dream. And um, later on I performed with this as a backdrop um, and myself lying in a chase lounge um, naked with a snake for a private performance. But I'm not showing images of that here. So, um, and then I got more into persona. Um, I was invited to do a, a group to participate in a group performance by a group called Non Grata. I'm not sure if you know of them, but they're this Eastern European group from Estonia, and um, they travel around the world and they get performance artists to perform with them, and so kind of they, they kind of create this grand narrative um, where, as a performer, each individual performer is invited to bring in their own performance character and create um, kind of do these improvisational performances. So as I was talking about earlier with pageantry, pageantry is something that's kind of important in Jamaican culture. We make a big deal about uh, beauty pageants. I was actually in a beauty pageant when I moved to New York um, because I was, a, you know, I was new here, I had nothing else to do and I was like, oh, yeah, let, let's try it and see what happens. And so um, I, I was first runner up, but um, that's okay. It was cool to get a free trip out of it and some money. And um, later on, um, I decided to use this as a character. Um, and you know, of course, the typical behavior that's expected of a beauty pageant contestant or winner is that she's very, you know, decent, you know, well mannered. But here I am doing the opposite. I start out that way, and then I end up with a boombox, and I'm handing out flyers for post dated um, events in Jamaica. So the the viewer could not. Whoever is getting a flyer could not um, actually access what was on it because it's in another country and it's in the past. So I was playing a lot with that, like this trickery. And here's another performance where um, that same character, um, this is in Tallahassee, um, this piece seemed to be more about death. And so just um, 
on a whim, you know, we perform on a whim. So, so this character suddenly um, is laying there. I decide to interrupt that, that particular space, put my sarong on this character, and there is a, a, a poster board that you saw there. I saw there, there was a spray can. These were my particular props. And then I spray painted the word, the word death, and then I walked away, and that was kind of the end of the performance. Um, and then this is another piece. Um, created for um, a performance art festival in China. Um, I was invited by the Chinese consulate to do a, a performance there. Um, and being that I'm, I'm working on, I was working, uh, interested in working on immigration, um, my own personal history as being part Chinese is, has always been kind of a history and I'm still kind of discovering more and more about it, um, I find it fascinating. So I was I decided to make a piece about it. Um, it was a piece that kind of evolved. It took like about three years to, to really make. Um, I performed it in 2012, just outside of of this of the festival, and then I was invited two years later to um, show the completed version. So this is a, just a two-minute clip. Fewer than 50 of these immigrants survived. The rest died of yellow fever. That piece was, um, as you saw, there were fish in the tank, and I broke the tank, took the fish out, put them in another container. So that is kind of a metaphor from, you know, moving from one place to the next, starting over, new beginning, new journey. And um, shortly after I did that performance, I think that was like two days later, I found the actual um, village of my family name, and this is in Guangzhou, and Guangzhou, and it's actually like a sunflower field. So. Um, that that was a very um, even you know very um, meaningful time for me, and I took in all of this imagery in this landscape, and um, so being that flowers and art agriculture is like a big part of my own family history, um, that is something that I, I continue to use, and you'll see um, iterations of the sunflower in the next work I'll sh in one of the next works I'll show you, but. Uh, then I went into doing a performance based on the military that I saw in China, um, which actually interrupted our performances. And so this piece is called The Peaceful Army. I made uh, screen printed t-shirts in a particular design and um, cutouts out of foam core and made these um, poster board pieces and we carried them around. So, um, if there's a little, this is about 45 seconds. So I choreographed a little army drill.
So that's pretty much it. Um, then there's this piece called Dawn of the Hurricane. Basically, I'm standing in the landscape in Jamaica. Um, maybe I can fast forward a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm entering my grandmother's um, landscape, um, her, her yard her property and I see the the, um, the wind is coming. This is actually shot the day before a hurricane so the wind is really strong and um, in the end of it um, it's the reaction of the locals the morning after. Okay, so that was the end of a family vacation. We were actually stuck there and could not leave the island for another couple of days. <laughs> um, so I made a performance about it too, and basically I'm wearing the same costume, but it becomes about this whipping motion where I have a black cloak on, and I'm just whipping it around, and I have these paper butterfly cutouts that fall, and then they create this kind of, um, you know, its own <laughs> hurricane effect. Um, then I went on to make a performance, a site-specific performance for Atlantic Salt for the Lumen Festival. And um, it was more uh, the kind of performance where it's about, um, uh, about giving and, and, and it's, it's, it's called The Lost Tribe of Mount Madagascar. And um, it, I called it that because when I was doing research one day in the library, I found this image and the woman on the, in, in the black and white, the black and white part of my face is really of another woman and she's from Madagascar. And, I, and the leaf that, um, that I made this tea out of for this performance where I'm giving out this tea um, is a plant from Madagascar. So yeah, it was research on Madagascar. <laughs> and so that's why I decided to call it that. And I made these flags and gave out tea. Um, and then um, this is, much more recent. This is the piece that you saw in the middle of that past video um, where I was um, dancing around. And so I'm just going to fast forward a little bit to the ending of the piece where it's more about the action of... Um, I stood there for two hours and um, pretty much holding the pose alternating the hands and um, in the end the uh, it's about the fruit falling So I had the elders cheering me on. They invited the elders to come to see that particular, particular performance. And it meant a lot to me because the elders reminded me of my grandparents, my grandmothers that that was inspired by. So then I made another piece um, titled Gypsy's Picnic. I made a series, that's the name of the series. And this is one of the other dresses where it was presented um, in a few other formats. Um, this is with my um, artist friend Rebecca Goyette for her film Ghost Bitch Arise from the Gallows. So I'm here as a character called Tituba, and Tituba is uh, an actual um, uh, black, she's called the Black Witch of Salem um, because I think it's based on a true story. <laughs> yeah, that um, she was the first Black Witch of Salem um, and she was actually captured from uh, Barbados 
um, and came to the States and she was under um, slave rule. So she was uh, serving and she has this, these witchcraft abilities apparently. Um, and this is also based on true, on true story. So she has this relationship with this character. And uh, here I am, I've done many different iterations of this piece. You may have seen this on the website here. Um, this was shot in New Orleans at Tomb of the Unnamed Slave. Um, here it is at uh, another extension of the piece where I have, I have three different, uh, different skirts for the piece. So one is round, one is long. Um, there's another one that's shorter. Um, and so, so the different versions. And here is just a short clip of what happened in New Orleans. going to end that one there. So this was at Jackson Square. There were lynchings. And um, it's uh, kind of fascinating for me, this video piece, this video documentation, because I really wanted to have three apples strung there, because there was a history I heard of three lynchings there. 
And so um, it, was, it was interesting to see that symmetry back with uh, the two young uh, white girls looking back at the moment that I dropped the apples and there were the two apples there. So it was, it was very, very um, eerie for me, but. Um, anyway, I went on to make more picnic uh, costumed type pieces and this is done uh, at a lake upstate where um, we took over the, the little barge out there in the middle of the lake and I created a picnic and I cooked a feast uh, made of the Jamaican national dish. I actually had um, some ackee and saltfish. Some of you might know that what that is, but it's a Jamaican fruit and it's cooked with codfish and I served it out there for people who would take the rowboats into the middle of the, um, the lake. And this is my last piece that I'm gonna close with. Um, this is called America the Beautiful, and that is, this is the end of the piece that you saw, that I opened with, and um, I'm gonna play the end of this clip that I have, and we can close it. Here we are, 2016, and we're hearing these exact same things every day on the campaign trail. We are drowning in it. And all of us are doing what women have always done. We're trying to keep our heads above water. Just trying to get through it. Trying to pretend like this doesn't really bother us. Maybe because we think that admitting how much it hurts makes us as women look weak. Maybe we're afraid to be that vulnerable. Maybe we've grown accustomed to swallowing these emotions and staying quiet because we've seen that people often won't take our word over his. Or maybe we don't want to believe that there are still people out there who think so little of us as women. Too many are treating this as just another day's headline, as if our outrage is overblown or unwarranted unwarranted, as if this is normal, just politics as usual. But New Hampshire, yeah, be clear, this is not normal. This is not politics as usual. This is disgraceful. It is intolerable. Thank you for the presentation, by um, the way. Um, but I wanted to know if um, that piece where you were drinking water out of the ceiling, mm -hmm. if you staged the woman drinking water in the back. If I staged the woman drinking? Yeah, there was a woman behind you drinking bottled water. Oh, no, I did yeah. not. No, no, it was not staged. <laughs> Great observation, though. Hi, so I'm curious. Um, uh, you showed in the early work where you were exploring different materials. Mm -hmm. And I guess you pick up on materials, uh, even in that last piece, where there's like plastic and flowers and stuff like that. Do you see yourself in the future going back into um, picking up materials, specifically, again, like sculpturally? You mean like salvaging materials from the street and using that in the work, or? That, or, or just specifically making something that operates as a standalone piece without the performance aspect to it? Um, kind of, yeah. Um, well, I think the dresses for me are like that because as you saw, there was a picture with one of the dresses on the mannequin and that's kind of the direction I see myself going in, making the costuming um, and um, having that be a standalone piece 
right now that's the only way I see that direction going. I don't really, yeah, not right now. <laughs> well, actually, more installation. It would be more installation where people can um, act with the pieces or, you know, be inside of the pieces in that way. Comments, but when you were talking about your pay, is it pagan? Is that the word pageant? Um, pageant. Pageant, yeah. And you were talking about like exploring your persona, or that's when you started to explore persona more. I sort of saw that there was a persona in your work, sort of from very early on when you were started performing. Oh yeah, like from the piece from 1997, yeah, the just, red. Yeah, like that you're sort of going into a character character mm. yeah I was it's funny because um, that first performance piece that you saw with me in the red I was really looking at like Yayoi Kusama and um, um, I would say Paul McCarthy mm. and then I made these um, these velvet and vinyl forms that reminded me a lot of the decor that I had while growing up these um, we call them hassacks but they were like foot rests kind of things. And so um, I would punch them in. In the actual video, I was punching them. That was the action. And um, so they would look kind of like bowls. And I'd put them over like my head, my arms, and just kind of like be very playful and very silly. Mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, I wasn't sure. I wasn't clear on what that particular character was. But I would start the the, that performance with like a, a, a little speech about the kind of exercise we were going to be doing because it was about exercising. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say about your um, work is there's something very sort of vulnerable and melancholic as well about your performances, I feel. Mm. There's this performance artist called Eleanor Anton, and mm. I don't know if you've heard of her, but um, your uh, piece, um, Kissing Columns, was like structurally very similar to one of her pieces where she, I don't know the name of that piece, but she um, basically, uh, you know, like kind of fornicated with the walls of the gallery that she was like looking at. I was wondering if um, that was a deliberate choice or did you know about that or? I didn't know about that piece back then. No, that was what two thousand six or something. No, I didn't. I didn't know about her work back then, and 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 it was like simultaneous performances going on at Exit Art at that time. Whenever they had these performances, there would be like ten other performers doing actions all over the space, and there would be art on the walls. So it would be a lot going on, and so I was very limited with with what I could use, what space I had. So I saw a column, it was blank, I went for it. Um, they wouldn't allow me to do that on the walls because it was too close to actual artworks that were hanging and it would disturb other pieces. So I just took that as a canvas, you know. Yeah. So in, because um, Pamela and I had the opportunity to work with you on that performance in New Orleans. Yeah. And so I saw how carefully planned your performances are, kind of going back to what B was saying about, you know, did you stage things? And I, what I noticed is that you, it's very, very carefully planned and researched, but then in the moment there were, you know, there were things that happened, we couldn't get to one of the locations for your performances and, or, you know, just even in the moment you would, to completely pivot and like find this really dramatic action that you hadn't told us you were going to do. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering if you could talk about how you, how you operate in the moment when you're mm -hmm. in a performance or you're just in a situation and you're like, or even just when you're thinking about new work, like opportunistically, like this is the, this is what I really want to get at, like kind of spontaneously. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you have to think. Yeah, um, you're forced to think on your feet, like really fast. Like even when I was here performing this, I was like, wait a minute, I don't think I have all the black balloons popped. And I hope all of you understand the metaphor of what that meant. But um, 
And then I went to the back row and someone was still blowing a black balloon and I like, like cough it up and she just like let it go. So it's just kind of like, that's kind of up, it's kind of chance, you know, you just have to be welcome to work, work with the chance. And I didn't even get to do the actual dance choreography part of it because of the way that this room is set up. So there are limitations and yeah, I had to think on my feet. I decided to get down here on my, on my knees and I even like ruined my, my boots earlier. So put on these actually. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, yeah, kind of forced to think on your feet and, and you, you just have to like, it, I, I don't know if I can explain it really, you know, like I had to, you just kind of have to work with what you have and I think um, being on tour with Non Grata, like we would be in a, in a, in a camper and we'd be driving up, uh, uh, from upstate New York all the way to Miami and I had to be uh, traveling with these guys for a whole week and we had to do, uh, we did pit stops to find places to stay that, of people that would host us but whenever, wherever we stopped we had to do performances and we had like and we had like two hours to plan a performance and I'm like, okay, we're gonna go to Party City. You, you pick out your props, um, the theme is this, boom. And like, I'd go and I would be like, okay, what can I get, what can I use? Um, I miss Jamaica the whole tour, okay. So um, I had to pick up, I picked up poster board as you saw, spray paint. I'm like, I'll just think of something. Whatever it is, the situation, I'll just write it and then parade with it or um, find some old flyers or something. You know, so yeah, you kind of forced to think on your feet, and I think it's a really good exercise if you're into performance or even just acting on a whim. You have to like use whatever materials you have. How long was the no Gata tour? Um, well, they would be on the road for a whole week, and then we landed in Miami um, like during our Basel. So we would be, I'd be with them in the camper for a whole week, a whole week. Um, yeah. It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of non grata, I have also performed with them oh, like cool. three different times. I yeah. was going to ask if you've been branded. If what? If you were branded. No. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, part of what they do is they brand, they brand their performers. Yeah. I just don't like pain like that. I don't like pain like that. So I wouldn't do it. But I've done, I've performed and been hurt, obviously. Um, <coughs> I really enjoyed like the, 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 all, like seeing all your works and the lineage of all your, your performances. Um, but I'm, I'm, and I know that you are a really good drawer, technically speaking. Oh. Um, like, I mean, having gone to school with you and seeing your work and seeing you switch hands when you broke one hand and you had to drew, draw with your other hand and see the, the level of technicality with your drawing with the opposite hand or the, the, the other hand. Um, and so I, you post randomly like sketches that you've shown tonight of ideas for performances and installations. <laughs> but I'm curious about, um, do you, like, I'm curious about, do you, uh, do you still draw just for the sake of drawing and do you still enjoy that, separate from your performance practice? Like, if, do you still make drawings just f to make drawings? Um, I draw performance. No, I'm not really, in, I, 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 I feel like if I draw something, it's pertaining to an installation or performance, it's part of the planning. But I do, in, but I do, I do enjoy the end result of that drawing. And I would do sometimes a series of drawings, and they could exist on their, their own in that form. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that. Um, I would love to have a show of just all the drawings of the performances, but that's something else. Um, as my background is Caribbean American, African American, and um, and um, European American, you know, um, I have all of that genetically in my background, um, but I only celebrate my African American culture for the most part. Um, I notice in your work that you are very careful to celebrate many facets of your identity, your ancestral legacy. Um, could you speak a little bit about embracing 
um, your Asian cultural identity as well as your um, um, African Caribbean um, identity? Um, yeah, um, so I, I, in recent years I've been willing to explore identity more and um, yeah, I, th I think it just kind of goes with the narrative of my, um, of, of, of my life, my life story is I'm trying to discover more about my Asian roots. So I traveled to Asia three times <laughs> and I'd be willing to go again and spend more time. And every time I go, I'm informed by new, by new things that I discover. So for instance, that piece that you saw with the colorful dress that's made out of the vinyl tablecloths. That was also inspired by uh, the Chinese Lazy Susans. Like every time I went to a Chinese restaurant there, pretty much they have these round, these tables that go round and round. And so it was inspired by that, like there's food all around. And um, just the fact that I could find these materials in what you'd call in Jamaica a Chinese shop or a 99 cent store. Like, it's, it's not far removed from, from me, you know? It's not far removed from um, the people that are related to me. So, um, yeah, I, w I, I willingly embrace that. And, and going to China, too, for that piece that you saw where I broke the fish tank, I, um, I looked every person in the audience face to face, up and down, and um, it's kind of like a form of acknowledgement um, hoping that like uh, I'm accepting you, will you accept me? Because a lot of times I um, I'm questioned with my identity. Like, okay, people ask you, what are you? And so um, in that particular piece, I think I addressed that and I told the story. As a matter of fact, even though you saw the English version of me telling them about like the out of the 50 immigrants, only a few survived. Um, it was translated in Chinese too, so the performance took almost twice as long because of the translation. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your, your question, but I'm willing to engage more with that, yeah.